So welcome everyone uh, to the uh, first uh, of the Lunch and Learns this April. I am Kate Dybel, uh, the systems librarian here at PCOM on the Philly campus. And I'm gonna be talking about introduction to print disabilities and access. And to start, I always think that it's, it's good for a person who's claiming expertise in the subject to give a little bit of their of background on who they are. So uh, for those of you, I'm relatively new here. Uh, you might, you know, you're seeing me now on camera, but also it's like I tend to use this icon here, my little cartoon avatar. Uh, and um, I started here in July, so I'm relatively new here still. My background is computer science. So I work in libraries, but I come from a computer background. And there I did my PhD work on why adults with reading disabilities, which includes dyslexia, why, why people tend not to use assistive reading technology. So I've done a lot of work in the accessibility space. I've been working in that space for 20 years now. And in particular, I've been working in libraries for about 10 years. And I have been uh, recognized as one of the leading experts and advocates for accessibility. Now, throughout this talk, uh, just so you know, I have a chat open in on another screen. So feel free to ask questions as I go along. It's, um, you know, I, I am here to help. I, this is supposed to be a teaching experience. So we'll go with that. I might, uh, you know, table your question for a little bit, but please ask questions. Plus, also, I'm going to ask you all for some of your own thoughts in a little bit. So let's start with a little bit of vocabulary. And I find this is important because in libraries in particular, we talk about accessibility a lot and we often mean different things. Here, I wanna talk about disability access. So by that, I'm pretty much meaning that disability exists and it's a part of the human experience. This might seem like, it might seem strange that I'm uh, pointing this out, but honestly, Disability, particularly as recognized as a human right, is still a relatively new thing. If you think about it, a lot of disability representation in the past, th there was a lot of uh, like unfortunate problems of uh, society hiding our, the people with disabilities. But the only people who really stayed visible were say like war heroes and veterans. So there's just a lot in there. Disability is, you know, you know, some people say like, oh, we didn't talk about autism in the 50s. Well, that's because of the way that people uh, treated people with autism and stuck them in asylums. There's a lot in there. But then too, it's like disability access is about acknowledging that there are barriers and difficulties within society, within our daily lives that impact the ability of people with uh, disabilities to perform certain things. I mean, the, the quintessential example is a person in a wheelchair faced with a flight of stairs. You know, where is the elevator? Where is the ramp? But it can vary up a lot more there. And particularly to disability access is about addressing those barriers and, and particularly trying to be proactive about it instead of like offering the solution of, oh, we'll go find someone, uh, some big burly men to pick up your wheelchair and just carry you up the stairs, even though they might drop you or damage your wheelchair or any other bad thing. It's better to think ahead and go ahead and do that. It's why we build elevators into buildings nowadays, or we ideally build uh, ramps into buildings, which by the way, accessibility benefits everyone. Do you, does anyone know who are who is the most common user of wheelchair ramps into buildings nowadays? It's not people in wheelchairs. It's moms with strollers, isn't it? Yep, Kate Delaney, you got it right. Uh, it's like parents with, parents with strollers use um, wheelchair ramps, uh, you know, accessible ramps all the time because was, stairs gonna, are annoying. I was going to say FedEx workers. They're, they're, they're the second biggest users, but honestly, <laughs> it impresses uh, par uh, when you mention parents, that makes more of an impact. But so I just want to start here. It's like this is supposed to be a 30 minute lunch and learn and I'm already prepared to last a little bit longer for questions and all that. But I just want to mention it's accessibility is big. I've been working in it for 20 years. If I could in 30 minutes give you the solution for accessibility, 
That would be pretty cool, but uh, I, it's not going to happen. I need at least 47 minutes, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, there's so much in there. It's disability is incredibly complex. There's so much diversity in it. Uh, the various tasks you have to consider and the access issues that can arise. The various technologies, legal standards, technology standards, laws, all that. And it changes. Uh, I, you know, just as much as we say like we're constantly learning accessibility, I am constantly keeping up on newest trends and everything with that. So, but here's a promise. This is supposed to be the start of everything you do. And, and anyone who's here, if you just start doing small things to improve accessibility, if it's just one thing and you only get to do one thing each year, Ideally, I'd like it to be, you know, one thing a month for day, weeks, you know, every hour, minute, second. That would be awesome. But as long as you're just making progress, you've made the world a better place. And that's a big part about accessibility. It's like you keep trying to improve things. And one of my roles and passions is to share accessibility practices. I've stayed in this space for 20 years because I'm very passionate about it. So there are going to be more talks like this one. And I'm going to be developing some resources for the PCOM community, too. So first of all, let's talk about what we're here about. And this is a big thing for libraries, is print access or print disability. And so print disability is, as it sounds, any disability that refers that impacts the act of reading. Print disability can also uh, refer to writing and other aspects of literacy. But reading is the biggest part. Generally, other things with literacy, if you don't have reading, you can't, you know, you kind of need to be able to read to be able to write, things like that. And some of the disabilities involved are blindness is the most, is the one that most people think of, but also low vision, people with, who have, you know, are extremely farsighted or even nearsighted or have difficulty focusing, their vision is blurry due to, say, cataracts. Then there is the dyslexia and other learning disabilities that impact the cognition behind reading. ADHD, attentional issues can impact reading. There are memory issues, that also makes sense. But also, you might not think about it as much, but mobility issues, the ability to hold a book or be able to turn pages is actually, you know, can be a barrier to reading. So just to give you some idea of numbers here. So in the United States, it's estimated about 26% of adults have a disability. This is all types of disability. So this is physical, sensory, cognitive, mental. So, but hey, that's a significant uh, number of us. I mean, right now we have 12 people here. Um, so that means uh, at least three of us. Uh, I'm one of them. Very proud to, you know, admit that I have disabilities and. As you, we, as you, if you start attending more talks like this, you might hear me even talk about which ones I have. According to the American Federation for the Blind, about 32.2 million U.S. adults have experienced a significant vision loss or impairment. That's a very large number there. And then for, say, like dyslexia, that's any, it, the estimates are widespread because dyslexia is difficult to, it, it's a complex syndrome that makes it, you know, medical people here should understand that like, oh, yeah, it's like people will debate. Is someone meeting the all the criteria for? And so it can be, I've seen numbers that are as low as like 4%, ranging up to 20%, but it's usually viewed as 5 to 15%. But here's the big other thing to recognize is that that's just dyslexia. When you consider other learning disabilities, um, it's generally viewed that 80% of those also will struggle significantly with reading. So it's often said that if a person has a learning disability, they most likely have a reading disability of some kind. So definitely pretty big there. Ah, John, John just asked a great question. Does wearing glasses to be able to see 2020 technically a disability? You can argue this, but I would say that Right, that those of us who wear these little marvels of technology, we all have a disability. Right now, even though my computer screen is, what, two feet from me, I can't read a thing on it. I am fairly crappy vision. My astigmatisms are at the upper limit of what physics allows in the human eye. So I need these. 
But the thing is, though, we don't think about these as assistive technologies, but they are. And it's, you know, it's something like we just incorporate them into regular life. And we just, why can't we do that for wheelchairs and other things like that? So let's get into some other stuff. Oh, I, I, I can go into, there's some fun stuff with the history of eyeglasses and everything out there. I mean, did you know that they were a fashion thing in uh, medieval Spain? Or not medieval, more like Renaissance Spain, 1600s. Is that Renaissance? I can't remember my history anymore. Oh, thank you, Kate. <laughs> uh, but like this, in terms of higher ed, um, it's kind of hard to get decent disability numbers because um, like most uh, demographic data, it gets self-reported and there's a lot of social pressures as to whether or not to state you have a disability. In fact, actually a recent study by the National Center for Education Statistics uh, suggests that only a third of, of college students will self-report. Two thirds of them choose not to, even though um, reporting, uh, self-reporting means that they would receive accommodation. So it's a big factor there. But just to give you an idea of what things are like, and this is for undergraduates. I'm trying to uh, uh, find some more recent data on, uh, on graduate students, particularly medical schools, because I'm curious about it. But generally it's about 20% of undergraduates will identify as having a disability. 4.2% uh, will have a visual disability, so that's blind or low vision. Uh, I'll admit, John, that um, people who wear glasses generally do not identify as having a disability, just because that's how things are. It's about 30% of people will have a learning or intentional disability. And this is the big one that I'm glad that they're finally including it in these studies and it's being recognized. 40% of college students will uh, uh, state to having depression or another mental health issue. So that's an entire other thing to talk about there. Not related to print disability, but worth talking about. And so let's uh, get into some other things here. So like, let's think about how to understand print access. So let's just begin with the idea of, let's just consider the task of reading something. It can be an art, you know, it can be a research article, it can be a novel, it can be a children's book, an FAQ on the web, a patient chart, whatever. Just think about that. And usually a lot of talks about accessibility will will start now with like going, oh, well, what, what difficulties would a person with dyslexia experience? What would be the difficulties that a blind person would get? would face? What technologies would they use? And that's a, those are actually good questions. And I am, you know, willing to talk about those, but I want to flip that picture and look at it differently. And I, this is where I'm going to ask you all for some feedback. Here's the thing. Reading is not a natural act. It is, there's nothing in our genetic, in our biology that makes reading be a thing. It is a technology. It is something we developed. Language, communication, those are, there is evidence that those are part of our evolution. But the idea of, you know, taking what we're thinking, what we're saying, and recording it in a more permanent way, that is very novel. That's technology. And the thing is, is that the printed page has co-evolved with the reading process over the last several centuries. Basically, they're two separate things. There's the art of writing things down and the art of digesting what we've written down. And those have mutually impacted each other. So as we improve, say, typesetting, printmaking and all that, we read more. You know, almost everyone who uh, learns your European history, we hear about well, Gutenberg invented multi, uh, you know, movable type. Actually, several people did at the same time. And that led to a literacy boon. And that did. And so we read more. And as we read more, we favored certain features over others. Um, we recognized like, hey, I really like that font. So more publishers use that font. Or it's like, you know, those books are way too big. I need something that's a little more handheld. And publishers responded to that. So, but at the same time too, publishers are saying like, well, we can't do that exactly because, you know, paper comes in these sizes, but we can do this. And so we got used to uh, the fact that, oh, 
most texts nowadays are about 60 to 75 characters per line. That's so hardwired into us now that that's, there is no biological reason why we should favor that, but our reading performance improves as long as we keep about that many characters on average. It, it varies if you make the text really big and all that, but yeah, there are just these weird things about reading, about reading behaviors that only are explainable by the fact that this is how we design text to work. And also, too, it's like, you know, and then type center, type centers implemented these new features. You know, even the act of reading online has changed the nature of our reading. You know, we read differently versus a computer screen versus a book. And even like, you know, there's evidence now that like we are reading differently on like e-reader devices on our phones. But here's the thing, though, all these features that that occur in text. They are affordances, and that's another vocabulary word to say about. Affordances are a are basically what are the features in a technology that make it good to use? What makes it more beneficial? So I want to ask you this. What are some of the affordances found in printed text today? When you're reading something, what are the things that make it an easier read for you? And so please put these in, uh, you know, in there. I have some uh, various answers, but I love seeing what people think about here. And trust me, there are no wrong answers. Oh, so Barbara, you're mentioning a page. Yes, pages actually have a lot of value to that. It's, you know, it's a chunking of what you read. And it also enables people to be able to, um, you know, be able to say like, oh, Turn to page three, or we're going to read pages seven through 19. Bold and highlighted text. Ah, kerning, spacing of characters. Yep, exactly. Like, you know, th the typography matters a lot. You know, it's like, are the letters too tight together? Are they too loose? You know, how much can we readily tell what is a word versus, you know, what are the letters in a word versus the separation from a word? Contemporary English. Oh, yeah, it's like our vocabulary changes a lot. Uh, script versus text, yeah, you know, many of us don't like reading papyrus or, or you know, chancery, a table of contents. And I'll suggest with that, that includes, you know, what uh, John said and uh, table of contents. That leads to the notion of headings. Headings are incredibly powerful. Yep, that oh, and cursive. Oh, don't get me started on the impact of cursive on, uh, on uh, writing uh, development. Yeah, I, even though I have a computer science background, I took a lot of education courses and uh, kind of live in there. So let's kind of get into these. And you, you hit a lot of these. Typography. Uh, good typography, fonts, letter spacing, line spacing, text justification, colors. All of those are huge things. You know, I, it's easy to think of text that is horrible to read versus things that are easy to read. Headings allow you to scan, you know. Uh, the example I give is when I learned how to read uh, APA papers, um, my, ins my instructor, he said like, yeah, I never read it from uh, the beginning to the end. It's, uh, you know, it's like going like, yeah, it's like I skip the introduction and background. I immediately look at like the methodology section to figure out what they're doing, scan the, you know, results to get an idea of like, okay, how much that jive with what the abstract's saying. Then really read the discussion, and then if I really feel like the paper's worth it, you dive into it. So there's just a lot there. You know, images, tables, figures, you know, we, you know, it's not just text. There's a lot of other features in there. But there's other stuff too, such as pagination and line breaking. A lot of people don't realize this, but it actually aids memory. When you uh, turn a page or change, you know, the view on that, that just gives a brief pause in the brain to kind of like chunk the memory. So like a lot of early hypermedia studies talked about and found that that was what made it do. So it just kind of become natural to it. A lot, that's why scrolling is not necessarily there. Oh, captions. Yep. Captions are great too. Like physical proximity of captions. A caption should ideally be near, you know, things like tables and all that. Uh, table rows and column headers, you know, Imagine a table that just is a list of numbers. It's gonna be kind of hard to figure out. A list with bullets and numbering. There are so many of these. And right here, everything that you've listed, that's the secret to making accessible text. 
anytime you want to make a good document, a document that's accessible, you need to make good choices in typography. You need to talk about heading and outline structures. Providing headings for anything that becomes, you know, of something of a certain length is going to be valuable. This even includes titles. Alternative texts or descriptions for images and tables. There should always be that caption, you know, to be able to know like what that is. I and mean, not everyone will immediately recognize an image. And by the way, alternative text is about doing something a little bit more complex. This is something that gets into more accessibility, where you provide additional description for a person who's blind or low or has low vision. And in fact, I will be giving a talk on that in early May. Table headers, that's one thing there. You know, proper linking of footnotes, references, all sorts of these things. A lot of, that's one of the key things I always want to bring home about print access is that the things that, you know, you find that help you read better are most likely going to be best practices for print access. It's an important thing to recognize there. So you don't necessarily have to know all about like how the how reading cognition works, how various disabilities impact reading. You don't necessarily need to know that. You just need to do good things. And you know, and a lot of it is about like understanding, oh, how do I choose a good font? What is a good color contrast? How do I make sure that things are are headings? And that's actually a lot of what these various talks will be about here. Like I said, this is an introduction to the concept. And here's the thing, these apply to both physical and digital documents. And just to give you an idea on that, in two weeks, you know, at this exact time, I will be talking about Microsoft Office and accessibility. Like, how do you do this in Word? What are the things you do in PowerPoint? And even being able to show off some really cool features in there and built into the to that software and i'll also just mention now it's like yeah you you can use the same techniques in google but microsoft office helps you a lot more yes i'm actually but really you still are probably curious how do people with various print disabilities interact with text and we're already at 12 25 here and i knew this is going to get in there so i'm you know uh, this is going to be recorded. I'm going to share these slides. I'm eventually going to build a library guide for all this. I hope to start working on this. Um, actually, I hope to actually have something up before the next uh, uh, talk. But we had uh, tech issues for me to deal with. Yeah, I, I, the library keeps me busy. But let's just get into a few things here, just examples. So I first want to just talk about mobility because we don't often think about it, but there are interesting questions here, like holding a book or turning pages. And like in these slides, I have examples of the quad hand clip, which is a little device that has a rubber, it's extended out rubber nub, so you don't need the fine finger control. You just have to do that. And then there are these more complex, uh, you know, you know, mechanical, page turners honestly my 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 experience with them has been like oh they're not very they don't work great they tend to tear pages they're actually more popular with piano players because what they you can do is you can have a foot switch on the floor and it will turn the uh, music for you or you could have someone doing that uh, for low vision, we're talking a lot about magnification lenses, you know, magnification devices, there's software, and there are talking books. And I want to highlight a few of these. So, for example, uh, I have an image here, the DaVinci Pro Magnifier, which is a dedicated computer screen with a camera mounted to it. The camera points down, and it will magnify what you have on the table below you. And it can do quite a few things. It can also talk at you. It can do some color corrections. They're pretty expensive though, but you know, and all of these, I have these slides, which uh, we'll share out, uh, make sure are available. Uh, like uh, I'll make sure that they're linked from the uh, YouTube page. But you know, um, they're pretty cool there. Uh, and also in terms of magnification software. So I hope that a lot of you know that like when you're in a browser, you can always hit control plus or control minus. If you're on a Mac, it's command plus, command minus. Um, and that will uh, magnify what's on the content for that particular uh, website. 
On Windows, if you want to ex explore like the built-in accessibility features, there's a built-in magnifier. I can't demo it because you can't demo it over screen sharing. It doesn't work that way. Um, uh, but it's like, so you can turn it on by just doing the Windows key and M. Might not want to do it right now. Uh, you do uh, Windows key escape to turn it off. And I will warn you, it can be a bit weird if you have multiple screens on. Um, it's not designed for that. Generally, most people who are who have low vision don't use multiple screens. And then there's commercial software like Zoom Text. And I that's a link to a YouTube video that demos it. But I do want to highlight the uh, talking books. Talking books are pretty cool. I mean, they're audio books, um, you know, and they, they can range from humans recording it, which is which are preferred by some people to just uh, text produced by software, just a computer synthesis. And the Library of Congress actually provides free devices and and audiobooks to uh, people who, with various print disabilities. So uh, here's an image of what that device looks like. It's about the size of an old style tape recorder. For those of you who remember it, it's about uh, five inches by three to four inches. Uh, it's portable, it has large buttons on it, and you just insert in. I actually have one of these. I need to, I, I've almost figured out why it, why it broke, but I'll probably bring it in once I like unpack it. But there's also a link to a video for it here, which is perhaps one of my favorite like little commercial snippets ever it's just all about like promoting reading there's diversity there's some you know interest in stem it, it's just a great video I, I i will actually play it at you know in a moment here i don't you know it's 12 30 people you can leave if you want i plan on this just going a little bit longer oh. nope sorry uh, there are other things, text-to-speech software, uh, which um, basically reads aloud electronic text. It's for dyslexia and other uh, learning disabilities. It often uses a reading highlight. I want to be clear, it is not the same thing as a screen reader. And there's some software here. I can demo it in a second. There are screen readers, and these are very complex, robust software that act as an interface for people who are blind or have low vision. Basically, it, a screen reader translates all the information uh, displayed on a screen to the, uh, to the blind user. So they're very, very complex tools. They're very complicated. They do have a strong, uh, a complex learning uh, curve related to them, but, um, they are the main means by which uh, people who are blind or have low vision interact with computers nowadays. It, they're required, and it's pretty much most accessibility work for like the web involves making sure you're doing screen reader support. And there are some common ones out there. Uh, there's JAWS and NVDA on Windows. NVDA is actually free software. On a Mac, there's built-in and free voiceover. There's also screen readers on your smartphones. Uh, Talkback on Android phones, and it's also it's it's a variation of VoiceOver on um, on iPhones. And I have a video here of demo of a screen reader, which I'll switch to playing a few of these. It's I've learned that Google Meet is not the best for sharing audio. No, I don't want that. But you might also be curious about Braille. So Braille is that tactile, those raised dots you see on elevator buttons and things like that. It, you know, they're in that three by two matrix. And one of the things I want to explain to people is that, you know, it's not a direct one-to-one -one conversion of letters to dots. It's more complex than that. Well, first of all, you think it's like, well, it's not just letters that matter. There's punctuation, there are numbers. And well, if you can do your math, a uh, three by two matrix of dots, so that's technically, you know, that's six dots uh, per character. Uh, there are two to the six, because uh, it's either a raised dot or not. That's only 32 characters. 26 letters plus 10 numbers, or 10 digits you're already lost there. So it's actually, there's a lot of uh, things that are called contractions or most common letter pairs. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, 
Then there are also computer devices that uh, do exist to display rules of Braille. And this is a video down here of it. So basically there are these little movable up and down dots on it. Um, if you're old school and you remember the movie in the 90s called Sneakers, which, which starred uh, Robert Redford and uh, Sidney Poitier, very good movie. It's a nice little techno conspiracy thing. Uh, you know, um, it's worth it. There was a character he used it in there. And these exist. But here's the thing. You might think it's like, oh, Braille. We should be caring about Braille a lot. Uh, you know, it's like, how do I produce, like, Braille versions of papers and stuff? Here's the thing that's worth knowing. Only 10% of blind people really currently know or use Braille. This is often referred to as the Braille Literacy Crisis uh, from the uh, National Federation for the Blind. And there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, some of it is the limited access to Braille text, because Braille takes a lot to produce. If the paper is thick and expensive. Braille texts are also really bulky. Um, a the first uh, the first book in Harry po in the Harry Potter series, uh, when printed out in Braille, depending on how large of sheets you're using, it can be anywhere from like two feet thick to like four feet thick. An entire Bible in Braille takes up an entire bookshelf. And the reason for this is, is that, well, Braille characters have to be a certain size so that the finger can feel it. They're also, it's, you can only, uh, like, you have a choice of either because Braille is imprinted on the paper. You, if you're going to make it double-sided, you can't have Braille dots overlapping each other on both sides. So you can only, like, do, it is truly double-spaced if it's uh, two-sided. So the, the books take up a lot. And if you've ever seen the uh, crap, um, uh, crap, I can't remember the name of the really bad uh, Denzel Washington, uh, the Book of Eli. Um, I, I'm going to spoil it for you there. This guy is apparently carrying around in a coat jacket a complete Braille version of the Bible. If you know things, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but then, too, it's like the other reasons for the Braille illiteracy uh, crisis or is that uh, the convenience of electronic text and speech synthesis. And even then, up until very recently, most Braille devices were exceedingly expensive. We're talking about usually five to six figures for a single device. And they broke all the time. And there have been some really cool innovations in them where now there are ones that are under $1,000 that are lasting for years. Um, I have a friend who has one that, you know, she it, she recently bragged, you know, she bought it for under 500 So it's, it's changing. So you might see a change in this. But I just wanted to introduce you all to the notions of print access. You're probably feeling a little overwhelmed, and that's okay. There's a lot to learn. But I will be here to help guide you. And the thing is, that, as I've always said, is that the more you can do, you know, it's like you're going to be benefiting everyone. An accessible document is usable for more people beyond those with a print disability. And we'll be getting into, like, the various things you can do. So, yeah, and you know, I'll put it this way. I'm new to PCOM. I love my job here. I love Philly. So I do hope to stay here. So, you know, let's work with that. And just a reminder, in two weeks, we're going to be talking about how to do this in Word and PowerPoint. And really, please reach out. Um, I'm here on the PCOM campus, so the Philly campus. I am Catharide. Just to be clear, I am the Catharide with a K. Kate Delaney uh, on the Georgia campus is the Catharide with a C. And yes, we have a lot of Kates in the library, and we all have the same last initial, too. But there's a lot here. And so, you know, kind of thoughts and questions. I would like to at least show one of the videos because I think it is so powerful. I just have to maneuver things on here. Okay, stop sharing that. And feel free to ask questions or anything there. Oh, Gavin, that's a great book uh, by... In fact, if you want to suggest other ones, the library has ordered the book Demystifying Disability, What to Know, What to Say, and What to Do by Emily Laddow. She is an awesome uh, advocate. 
And if you're interested in any of the other recommendations, I am happy to talk to you. So let's go to um, there. So this is the video I told you about from Library, from the Library I, of Congress in Washington, D.C. Is the audio coming through? There is no place like space. Grandpa, look what I'm reading. Have you read about astronaut Abby? No, oh, sweetheart, I'd love to, but the print is just too small. Hey, sweetheart. There's no place like, like space. space. Grandpa, you read my book? I listened to it. Thanks to you two, I enrolled in NLS. NLS is a free library service from the Library of Congress for people who have difficulty reading print due to a visual or physical impairment. Lifetime memberships are free, and all NLS patrons receive a free talking book player upon enrollment. This has been a... I'm sorry, I just love that video. It's... You know, it's just one the power. One of the reasons why I got into disability work was because I am I, I love reading. It it was inevitable that I was going to end up in libraries, and being able to, you know, recognize the power of literacy, the power of being able to share reading like that, it's just a big part there. And so that's why I'm a big advocate for this. But if you want to talk about some of the other examples, so let me actually show. Um, So just to give you an idea of how certain things work, this is, um, so I mentioned a text-to-speech tool. So this is Read and Write Gold. I, I'm using the Chrome uh, plugin version here so I can demonstrate this. So this is a tool that just reads things out loud to everyone. And yeah, I chose Platypus Venom to give you an idea here. But this is on how like a tool like this often works is, is that you select text to for it to play and then you can just play it. The platypus is one of the few living mammals to produce venom. The venom is made in venom glands that are connected to hollow spurs on their hind legs. It is primarily made during the mating season. One, all the venom's effects. So. One of the things I wanted to point out there, you see the running highlight that it does. So it highlights both the current sentence and the current word. It also, though, unfortunately, will read things that you might not necessarily expect to hear because it got to that reference uh, footnote there of one. And so you'll hear that. And it can get really annoying because if you tell it to read the entire page, you can already imagine uh, what's going to happen. On. Contents. Hide. Top. Spur and crural gland. Yeah. Venom. Effect. So as we get into more advanced topics in um, making accessible text, there are ways to actually make sure that tools like this do not actually, you know, announce all that extra material. So there are things you could do as saying like, oh, on this page uh, for reading aloud, let's actually say, tell it where to start or like what parts there. Um, for a screen reader, it's a little bit different. There are all these here. And Justin, and I at least want you all to get an experience of what a screen reader looks like. I do hope to actually be able to demo a screen reader experience. Um, maybe not for the next one, because uh, we're going to have to switch to using Zoom for this, but uh, for that. But here's... Um, Good example of a screen reader here. This is Mark Sutton from the University of California, San Francisco's IT Web Services Department. Here today with a brief tour of screen reading technology. I'm a blind person who has been using screen readers, braille writers, scanning equipment, other so That's an example of a braille reader there. What a screen reader does is, for example, I'm going to read this, start to read this page. 
Blake, University of California, San Francisco. Blake, and it's Blake, displaying Blake, what he's hearing. And what I will now do is slow down the speech rate. 80%. 75%, 70%, 65%, 60%, 55%, 55%, 45%, link, UCSF Medical Center. So as I was about to say, a screen reader yeah. converts what's on a computer screen into information that can be displayed through synthetic speech or braille output. Yeah, so what was happening here, he was using the tab key to move to different links on the page. And so when it got to, if you see that, highlighted you know square around that link it was saying like oh this is a link so that means it's something that can be clicked on and it gives the text that's displayed there this is what a screen reader does it can, you can navigate to different links you can navigate to tables to forms you can have it read the entire page you can have it jump by headings they're very powerful tools now you note that he also had to um demo the um you know, uh, like slowing down the text and everything, because a lot of screen reader users will often listen to it at accelerated rates because, well, if you have to listen to everything, you don't want it necessarily to be read in a, you know, in the ways that you would normally expect text to speech to work. So, you know, it's like, oh, regular speaking case. So these are all just aspects to it. Um, you know, I recommend, uh, I will make sure that, in fact, actually, I will share right now. Just let me grab the link so you all can have the slides since you're here. So I included in the chat, please grab the slides while you have them there. Of like yeah, of everything there. I hope that this was at least wet your interest some. Um, I would love to hear suggestions on things that you would like to to hear about. So the talks I have planned for at least uh, so far is on Microsoft accessibility, particularly with Word and PowerPoint, because those are very common software and there's a lot of good practices you can develop there. Then I'll be talking about writing alt text for images and what that is. But other things I can talk about, I can demo and get go into how various technologies work more. Um, particularly, I can do a screen reader demonstration and what works and doesn't work on a website. You know, just little things. Or even like how to do accessibility testing. You give me a website and I can then show you right away if it's accessible or not and what that means. So it's like one of those, like I know John Pentecost is here. So for IT, if you need to do specialized talks on this, or if you want to be involved in anything, you know, I'm not officially a liaison librarian. You know, I'm more back of the house of the library, but if you ever need to talk about disability or accessibility, I'm a go-to resource and I invite you all to come forward with that. So please um, hope all is well. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, the week. Uh, if you're in Philly, stay cool. But yeah, there's a lot of fun things here. And like, and I hope that it's coming through that I love this topic. It is, there's so much cool, fun things that you can actually do with accessibility. And it's all about just, frankly, it's kindness. It's about doing things that benefit everyone, so. So yeah, I'm going to.